I watch as her body came off the floor, her whole body lifted off the floor about three inches off the floor. And she begins to essentially levitate in the surface. And that, I was so intrigued. And you know, as a young child, looking back at it now, I recognize, mm, I was intrigued because I have a call to deliverance. And so something in me, immediately I lost my fear and all I wanted to do was watch as my grandmother used was used by the power of God to subdue this thing living inside of this woman. Jordan, welcome back to Delafay Testimonies. It's good to be here. Uh, you were the first one that we actually uh, released on yes. this channel. For people who have not seen that testimony, just tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us a little bit about your salvation testimony of how you came into this relationship with the Lord. Yeah, definitely. Well, um, my salvation story looks like this. I was raised in church. I uh, always kind of remember loving the Lord or having some level of relationship with the Lord. I was saved at seven years old, really. Got filled with the Holy Ghost at seven years old. Prophesied at seven years old. Really just met the Lord around that age and grew up in the ministry. My grandmother's a senior leader in ministry. My dad is a pastor as well. I have pastors on both sides of my family. One side's hardcore Pentecostal, the other side's very much so Baptist. So I kind of got both sides, um, both extremes, if you will, of the kingdom growing up. You know, middle school came, the desire to be normal, um, caught back on fire for the Lord back when I was in high school. And uh, I've had visitations from the Lord, various things throughout my life that, uh, have kind of almost in a sense, one confirmed the call, but also confirmed to me that he was real. So I've always, I can't remember a day where I didn't love Jesus um, because I'm one of those cases where I was exposed to church so little. And um, that's pretty much my story. Yeah. For anybody who has not watched the testimony, we are going to be linking it on your screen and it also will be in the description box below. So definitely make sure to check it out to get a little bit more insight into Jordan's incredible walk with the Lord. Now, Jordan, today you are going to share another testimony with mm -hmm. us. What is that testimony that you would like to share? I'm going to talk to you, Eric, about um, my story of how I got involved in the deliverance ministry. Come on. And how uh, the Lord introduced me to the casting out of devils and demons and, and things of that nature. <laughs> yeah, which is so interesting because it's such a popular topic it is a popular topic today right and so um yeah we're just honored that you would want to share this with us so wherever you want to start yeah i think firstly i want to talk about it because it is so popular i think it's important that people like me kind of open up and talk about how the lord introduced us because it seems like it's a move of god right now yeah and there's such a revelation for deliverance right now so why not talk about it you know my first time ever seeing a deliverance or um a demon cast out of somebody was one of the most terrifying experiences of my life. Like I said, I was raised like in a Pentecostal church, holiness, and uh, my grandmother, um, she's an apostle, and uh, this was like kind of like the prime of the ministry. And my grandmother's leader had came into town, a guy by the name of Apostle S.E. McKinney. He's gone on to be with the Lord right now. And he was known for the prophetic. He would prophesy, but I had never seen him cast out a demon out. And quite frankly, I didn't know what deliverance or the casting out of devils was. I was like eight years old, possibly. And um, we were at a little small storefront church in Sterling, Virginia. And um, Apostle McKinney was ministering, prophesying to people. And he laid hands on this one particular woman and she falls out under the power of God. And this was nothing abnormal to us. We had seen people slain in the Holy Ghost all the time. And I remember the woman, she begins to shake on the floor. Her whole body begins to shake like she's seizing, like having a seizure and stop. Seizure, stop. Seizure, stop. And I'm looking at her and as an eight year old boy, you know, I just love the Lord. I'm just with my grandmother at church at a, at a service that he had came to preach at. And I look at my grandma and I tap my grandma on the shoulder. I said, Grandma, something's not right. Even at that age, I knew a seizure is continuous. It was not something that just happens and stops, happens and stops usually. And my grandmother, you know, in, in her wisdom, you know, she said, I know, baby, just go sit down. And so I go back and sit down like I'm like on the third row and um, I see my grandmother and, and the pastor of that church, a woman, she's actually gone on with the Lord as well. They, come, they go down to the woman 
and they put their hands on the woman while she's seizing and stopping, seizing and stopping. And the moment my grandmother touches her belly, the woman opens her eyes and yells, no, but this no, it was not a regular no. The, uh, the voice that came out this woman's mouth was so deep that I'm convinced a woman with regular woman vocal cords couldn't make a sound that deep. Me as a grown man, I don't think I can make a sound that deep. And it was a no that came out of her belly. We could hear almost like two voices yelling at her at one time. Being Pentecostal, nothing we do is gentle, gentle or quiet, you know? So that freaked me out. So I start backing up. I'm sitting in my seat, like in the third row, and I start backing up like this in the chair. And my seat starts moving backwards because I was terrified. I went back so far, I went through about three rows of chairs just backing up like this because I was terrified. It actually kind of traumatized me because, you know, as an eight-year-old kid, you're not used to seeing anything like that. The lady, she begins to shake and yell no and begins to like, wrestle with Apostle McKinney's wife, First Lady uh, McKinney, and my grandmother and the pastor. And they begin to wrestle and begin to command this demon to come out. She begins to shake her head violently, saying no, like, no, this is my house, I belong here, things of that nature. And the best thing I can tell you is when you're sitting in the midst of a deliverance, even if it's your first time seeing deliverance, if you're saved and have the Holy Spirit, you immediately know what's happening right now. Even if you've never seen it before, you may be new to it, but immediately you, the Holy Spirit in you will recognize. Because at eight years old, I knew this is a demon and I knew my grandmother is getting it out the woman. And the woman, I watch as her body came off the floor, her whole body lifted off the floor about three inches off the floor. And she begins to essentially levitate in the surface. And that, I was so intrigued. And you know, as a young child, looking back at it now, I recognize, mm, I was intrigued because I have a call to deliverance. And so something in me, immediately I lost my fear and all I wanted to do was watch as my grandmother used was used by the power of God to subdue this thing living inside of this woman. And, you know, my grandmother sits on the woman, <laughs> essentially, and they pretty much hold her to the ground and begin to proceed to cast that demon out. And that was my first experience, seeing a demon cast out. Fast forwarding, throughout my childhood, I was tormented by demons in my sleep. Um, for years, I would say up to the age of 12, 13 years old, I was terrified of the dark. And not because the dark itself scared me, but because I would have visitations and encounters with demons in the dark. And you know, in my last testimony, I talked about how I was visited by the Lord. I've seen Jesus. I tell people, I said, I've had way more encounters with demons than I've had with Jesus. And it's not to say that you should believe God for more demonic encounters. It's just saying as a child that I, that I believe the enemy tried to scare me out of the supernatural possibly because I was called to cast out demons. So as a child, um, I remember living in my apartment with my mom. There was a three bedroom apartment, my grandmother in one apartment, in one room, my mom in the other. And I had the middle room that didn't have its own bathroom. And I uh, remember for, I would say for about a year straight, I would encounter demons um, in my like, in my sleep, I'd be wide awake. My mom would call them nightmares. As most good parents would say, these are nightmares, but I can recall that I was wide awake, sitting up in my bed, watching activity in my room. Sometimes my shoes would slide across the floor. Sometimes I would hear a random knock on my door. Um, sometimes the closet would open and it would close again. Sometimes my bed would shake randomly. I'll never forget. Um, and the devil, he's so crafty because he knows how to make himself appear animated. So when a child tries to describe him, the parents were saying, this is so animated, this can't be real. So things I would see, this is gonna sound crazy, people are probably gonna get mad, but I would see a literal T-Rex peeking out of my closet. I would see alligators move across my floor in my room, like real alligators walking across the floor in my room. I'll never forget a woman in an all white dress came and stood in my room and said, hello. And for some reason, this woman scared me more than the alligators and the T-Rex. I screamed and called for my mother. And she comes running, what's, what's wrong, what's wrong? I said, there's a woman in here. She just said hello to me. She, her face looked scary. She said, Jordan, that was a dream. But I knew for a fact it wasn't a dream because I never fell asleep that night. 
I did not fall asleep. And so, you know, that whole thing, even me not trying to prove it to you that I didn't, that it was a, a real occurrence. Um, and so the enemy really tormented me. I would have dreams of demons coming and attacking me. I had one particular demon come into my room. Um, I had to be like seven, eight, nine, or somewhere around, around that, that time frame. It all kind of runs together. But a demon came into my room and grabbed me by my ankle and essentially pulled me out of the bed. Um, I had one demon. I could hear it under my bed. And um, I could hear it talking to me about other demons. Now, this is very interesting. I heard the demon speaking to other demons about me. And it was saying, we're going to make sure that Jordan has no friends so that he can always remain lonely for the rest of his life. And as a kid, I woke up heartbroken because I knew immediately what one of the assignments, you will, of demons were in my life. It actually caused me, in a sense, to slip into a depression as a child. I didn't tell much people about it because when a child says they're depressed, people really don't pay attention, but it was actually the activity of demons working against me in my life. And so fast forward, you know, I grow up, I have these really strange encounters in middle school and I believe it was in middle school where the Lord opened my eyes spiritually again to see demons. I would see demons walking through my middle school. It was really weird. It was very prophetic. I would see demons walking around my school carrying signs. I'll never forget, I was in my school and I would see a demon walking through the hallway with a sign that said hate on it. And I remember freaking out because I would see these entities and they would see me and they would see me see them. And I would actually respond and tell my teacher what I was seeing. You know, and when, and you know, in secular education, when a child says, middle school says, I saw a demon or I see this entity or this monster, they're immediately thinking this kid needs medication. This kid is losing his mind. So there were several occasions where my mom would get called to the school and my mom was convinced I was losing my mind. And because everything everyone was telling me, I was convinced I was losing my mind. So they were talking about psych therapy, all, medication, all kind of things to kind of get me back. And I knew at this point my mom was worried and she didn't really believe that I was seeing demons. She thought I was losing my mind. And eventually that stuff kind of, you know, it wore off over time. And I think at that time in my life, I taught myself, just ignore it. Just act like you don't see it. And maybe if you act like you don't see it long enough, it'll go away. And ultimately it kind of did go away. And fast forward back to high school. High school, I really had a renewal of my faith. I'm around my junior year of high school, sophomore, junior year, that summer, I really caught on fire for the Lord again. And that's really what we saw, um, a, a level of revival hit my high school. We would see miracles. And this one friend of mine who's an evangelist, I would prophesy to people and he would get them healed. And then we turn around and I would get them healed and he would prophesy to them. And we were a really powerful duo, a team. We would pray for people. We had a, a Christian club. Now the Christian club was dry. I mean, like dry, dry. Like we played little icebreaker games and ate pizza and talked about like one Bible verse. Like it was like, it was, it was dry until we got in there, you know, all glory to God. Of course we got in there and we started talking about the supernatural power of God, healing power, the power of the Holy spirit being filled with the spirit. And we saw a small revival in a sense, kind of break out in our high school at the time because we introduced the school to the supernatural. And we went from pizza parties and Bible verses to laying hands and prophesying and healing the sick. And I never forget the oceanography teacher. I'm pretty sure she was an atheist and we ended up meeting in her classroom every day or after school. So it was very ironic. Like we're meeting in our atheist teacher's uh, classroom. I'll never forget the word of knowledge was very strong on me at that time. And I'll never forget this one particular girl. She begins to talk to me and a few of my friends about how she was tormented at night. And it all began to, in a sense, trigger me because I begin to recall what I went through as a child. And this was my first time really stepping over into deliverance as a 16 year old guy. And I'll never forget, we begin to pray for her. And, you know, in my mind, I wasn't expecting her to what we call today manifest, not this speak it manifesting stuff, but the manifesting, showing forth a demon inside of you. And I remember she falls back and I had seen plenty of people fall in the spirit before, but the way she fell back was different. It was strange. And she was doing 
the exact same thing I saw the woman do when I was seven years old. I remember, I said, I remember this. So immediately, because we all had the Holy Spirit, we knew this is a demon. And like this weight hit the room. We all knew we're about to cast out a demon in our school. And part of you is like excited, is like, whoa. And a part of you is like, what happens when it comes out? Is it gonna get on me? Like, can this person hurt me right now? So you're like, kind of like careful. And you're like inwardly, you know, 16 year old boys, you know, a lot of things are doing with lust. So inwardly, before you even go near, near the demon, you're like, Lord, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. I repent, don't let the thing call my sin out, you know? Because, you know, you raised up in Pentecostal church, they said, you better not cast out a demon with any sin in your life. That demon's gonna call your sin out. And so we, so I was, you know, just moving in a touch of religion, you know, I got free eventually. I'm like, Lord, wash me in the blood of Jesus. I, I don't want the demon to get me. I don't want the demon to, to call my sin out. And so then we begin to lay hands on her and we begin to say, we bind you. We only would say what we heard our pa my parents, my, my grandparents, people who I've ever seen do deliverance. Come out, devil. And I, you know, I'm just yelling, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. And like, come out, the blood of Jesus. And we're just like working. And she's squirming and she falls on the floor and she begins to go across the floor like a snake. At this point, we're just yelling in a little bit of fear, but also like trying to exercise our authority. And eventually she kind of coughed a little bit and we just all had this release that we know the demon left her. And so it was a pretty powerful experience. And actually me and two of my friends that was with me, we have actually not talked about it in detail to this day because it was such a heavy moment. And we never really talked about it in depth and they may have talked about it, but we never talked about it. And that was my first experience with the casting out of devils in my personal ministry. And I'll never forget. What did, what did that do to you afterwards? Like, I like you're going, you leave this class, you go home. Where are you at now that you've seen this and experienced this? You know, I was freaked out. And I really thought to myself, wow, the devil must be really mad at me. He's going to come after me now. Hmm. That was my first initial thought. Because when you're raised in a Pentecostal culture, and it's good to have this kind of raising, they always taught you about the retaliation of hell how whenever you do something for the kingdom, hell is going to retaliate. And you know what? Hell really retaliated in my life. I'll never forget, I was sitting in government class, and the whole issue of gay marriage came up. Now, mind you, like, I love gay people. I, I believe sin is sin, but I love all people. You know what I mean? And, but, you know, at the time, I was a little more zealous and religious a little bit, and also very vocal. So the way that I would approach things was not really in love. It was more righteousness without love. And we always know that kind of relates to religion. Now I know when I approach things such as same gender loving people, I approach it with righteousness and the word, but also I have to approach the people with love. But at the time I was not that way at all. You know, 17 year old Jordan was a tyrant, you know? <laughs> and so I'm sitting in government class and our class really wasn't a class. It was a debate hall we would get graded on our ability to communicate our, our political beliefs. And he would oftentimes stir the pot up. So he knows he has this super Christian guy who's most likely gonna end up a preacher, me. And then he has this guy in the classroom who's very much so into witchcraft. Like there was this one guy, he dressed like a girl and he was very much so a homosexual. And the guy didn't like me and I didn't like the guy. Now, looking back, I should have been more like Jesus. I admit that. I really, but to me, I'm like, it wasn't even the fact that he was a homosexual. It was that he's a witch. <laughs> and my coming up, I said, we don't play with witches. I got power over witches. And I still do. Praise the Lord. We praise God that witches can't touch us as Christians. Amen. But like, I could feel the spiritual tension between me and this guy. And he was opening, he wore the pentagram. He said, I'm a witch. I talk to spirits. I do witchcraft at 17, 18 years old. And I remember he intentionally brings up the subject. And remember at the time, I, I think gay marriage was about to be legalized nationally. And um, he says to me, uh, he, he says, Jordan, what do you think about gay marriage? And I said it very boldly. I said, it's not biblical. <laughs> you know, I forgot about politics. I was just thinking about the Bible. Um, it's not biblical. It's against nature. And I just start going in. And then I offended the guy, the other guy in the classroom that I just mentioned. And then he yells out of his mouth. 
He says, but yeah, you're supposed to be like Jesus in love. And I correct him and rebuked him. And I kind of said some really mean things to him. I didn't like shame him, but I do kind of regret some of the things I said, because what I said to him was not in love, you know? And a few nights later, I'm in my room sleep and I wake up and there's this green light pulsating in my room. I could hear a heartbeat in my room. It was like a boom, 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 boom. And I see this green light moving across my walls. And I'm wondering, what is that? I sit up, I turn around, and I had a headboard in my dad, my dad's house. I see sitting on my headboard the guy from my classroom. And he's breathing really heavy. And this green light is pulsating out of his mouth. And he's breathing what I knew to be a curse in my bedroom. He's just, and this green light was trying to come out of his mouth, but I could tell he was struggling to get it out of his mouth into my room. You would think I would go, I bind you, I, get out of my room. And, and we all know to this day, this is called astral projection, where witches will leave their bodies and try to curse people. And I look at him and I'm like, no, you can't do anything to me. There was this peace that came on me. Even today, I wouldn't even think that would be my natural reaction. It had to be the Holy Spirit. And I said, you can't do anything to me. And I turned over and went right back to sleep. And so somebody said, well, do you think this was a dream? It was a real encounter. The next day, the, I looked at the clock around this encounter. It was around 2 o'clock, 2.30ish. I looked on Facebook, and I'm friends with the guy on Facebook to this day. <laughs> and if, if he's watching, I love you, man. I just want to let you know. <laughs> but um, I look on his status on Facebook, and it's at 2 a.m. And he says, wow, I really need to step up my spiritual game. So I'm assuming he was essentially saying whatever he tried the night before essentially did not work. And from that point on seeing him in school, he was kind of awkward. He avoided me at all costs because um, I'm assuming he met the power of God that night and saw the protective nature of the power of God for his children, you know? So fast forwarding, going to ministry after I had my encounter with Jesus in 2012, I had a trip to heaven. I've talked about it in the last story where I saw Jesus, had that encounter. I was zealous for the Lord. And, you know, I would see a, a little bit of deliverance here, a little casting of devils there. And, you know, I really thought I was doing something. I thought I was God's great man of deliverance, you know? I said, I, 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 I I've casted out nine devils, you know, just like, you know, and, and praise God. God was training me, but nothing could have prepared me for what I was getting ready to experience. I would say around the year of 2014, I got really hungry for the Lord. And so I entered into a series of fast. I would fast three days here. I would fast five days here. And let me tell you this, to this day, I'm a horrible faster. I do not like fasting because I still am mastering self-control. So when it comes to eating after the fast, I always eat too much and I end up sick after every fast. It's it's, it's just something bad. I haven't mastered it. Um, if you have any tips, please put them in the comments, I guess. you know. But I end up fasting for 21 days. I went 21 days straight, nothing but water, apple juice, and orange juice and tea. That's all I went for, 20, for 21 days. And the presence of God was so strong on me during this fast. And I was like a drunk man in the presence of God. I'll never forget, I would go to my basement and I would say, Jesus, and I would collapse. I'd be on the floor for hours at a time. I couldn't do a closing prayer during that time because the presence of God would overwhelm me. I'll never forget, it was in the middle of that 21 day fast is when I first time, the first time I pulled a woman out of a wheelchair. She was on oxygen. She had just got out of the hospital for suicide and she manifested and the demon came right out. She stood out of her wheelchair. She actually got off of dialysis and she's totally healed to this day. Crazy experience, crazy testimony. And I was like, this is why I went on the fast. I was believing God for a miracle anointing, for God to up the miracles. I was seeing healings here and there, just like deliverance, but I was way more interested in miracles. I actually wanted to be Benny Hinn. I was convinced that I was the black Benny Hinn. And so I, 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 was, I was you know, working miracles and I wanted God to use me more. I said, I want blind eyes open. I wanna see deaf ears open. I wanna see cancer disappear. I said, I'm gonna fast for that, Lord. Because I believe if I fast and seek you and die to myself more and get in your presence, you're going to trust me with these greater miracles. And that actually is a principle that I've learned. That's true. But I've learned also that God will not always honor what you want on the fast. And I learned that after the fast, it seemed as if every demon in hell recognized me. I'll never forget I was in D.C. walking with a few people. And I walked through the homeless camp. 
a man called out of the tent, hey, Jordan, what are you doing in our city? And someone said, did you hear that? And I said, yes. They said, are you going to address that? I said, no. Did you hear what that demon said? This is their city. I'm from Manassas. I'm not dealing with a DC demon. And I'm more so I was a little terrified. I said, they know my name. <laughs> and from there, it seemed like every time I'd come into a service, deliverance would break out. I was actually at a ministry you attend, and um, it was the, the base camp. And we were out in Pennsylvania, and I was one of the guest speakers. I went to give a prophetic word, and I literally said, G. I didn't even say Jesus. I said, Jesus. The room was filled with like 100 people, and all of a sudden, you just see like 20 kids just hit the floor. Some kids begin to crawl like snakes. Other kids immediately begin to throw up. I see a woman in the front row. She starts yelling, I'll kill him. Like a 17-year-old sweet girl. Like, like, I'll kill him in a deep voice. And starts trying to crawl up the stairs. And it freaked me out. Like, freaked me out, freaked me out. Because I'm like, yo, what is going on here? I'm like, these are real demons going crazy. And so... You know, at that moment, I'm like, well, I have the mic. So instead of giving the prophetic word, I just start yelling, come out, come out. It, you would think that a bomb went off in that room because people who weren't even manifesting just started manifesting. And they just started bring, carrying people to the front who were, some were slithering, some were hissing, some were growling, some were roaring, some people with eyes and rolling the back of their head. And it seemed like everything in that room manifested. And we spent two hours casting demons at as many people as we can. The next morning, I was do, intending to do a Holy Ghost service and the Holy Ghost fell and more people began to manifest demons and begin to throw up and they begin to experience the freedom power of the Holy Spirit. And it was at that moment in my ministry, in my life, I know something has shifted. Something has shifted in my life and shifted in my ministry and God has given me another degree of authority. And you know what? Well, I said, I wanted miracles, but I'm okay with this because God is trusting me with this. I was okay up until maybe like possibly a little under a year ago when I had other experience. Leading up until that, I would go places, people would call me in for mass deliverance. I'll never forget this one really marked me. The Lord gave me a word of knowledge by a young woman and the Lord showed me her uncle while I was ministering to her prophetically. I remember seeing the smile on his face and the Lord told me, you were molested by your smiling uncle. And she immediately began to cry because it was true. And I was in Commerce, Georgia, I'll never forget. And the Lord said, cast the spirit of molestation out of her. And I was so shocked because I had heard people talk about the spirit of molestation and the spirit of violation. But I really, you know, I don't, I'm not too prone to believe what I hear until I experience it for myself. I actually lean more towards the side of skepticism rather than quick to believe. Because I always want to see the proof, you know? And so I begin to say, you spirit of molestation, come out. And I remember she looks up at me and she's smiling the same way that I saw her uncle smiling in the vision. And I knew it was that spirit of molestation. And she begins to manifest and she gets free. Another mass deliverance broke out that day. I was preaching on deliverance. And I remember a woman started manifesting while I was preaching. And the Holy Spirit actually said to me, and this would be some wisdom for somebody, he said, tell the demon to stop and to wait until you're done preaching. I, you know, me, I'm bold. I said, shut up. I said, shut up, you foul spirit. You know, when the Holy Spirit says, like, you know, sometimes we add stuff to what the Holy Spirit said. I said, shut up. I said, you are not to speak again until I get done preaching. I said, in Jesus' name, amen, after I got done preaching, immediately when we begin to manifest again. And we cast the demons out of the, the entire um, church. Fast forwarding, going back up, and I guess this is like my last story with this whole thing. This was actually in this building, and I had done mass deliverance in my church, but you know, over the over the years, I have acquired spiritual children, people who I love deeply, who you know, I some of them I led to Christ, some of them were already saved, but I got them filled with the Holy Ghost. You know, I introduced them to the call of God on their lives. You know, God used me to bring them out of a lukewarm lifestyle into a fiery, hot, passionate lifestyle. And some, for a lot of these people, the relationship was three and a half years deep and deeper. It was three years deep. And this is about maybe like about half a year ago, possibly. And we were doing a prayer revival. And I didn't want to do anything for the prayer revival, but except actually do what we came to do and seek the Lord and pray. And I remember we were praying the first night. One of my spiritual sons 
he begins to manifest demons. But I kind of already knew he had these demons. So it wasn't that much of a shock. And really, discipling him was getting a little difficult at the time just because I knew we were coming against some, some demons there. And so he manifests the first night, and um, I love him so deeply. And so when we begin to address it, we dealt with it a little bit, and he, he began to fight me and try to run away and try to uh, push him to the point where I tried to hold on to him, and, I, and like he picked me up in the air, and I pretty much held on to him, kind of fell and then grabbed him, and we had to pin him against the wall and cast the demon out of him that was manifesting at the time. He manifests the next night. This was, I would say, the wildest deliverance experience. I have ever experienced in my entire life. He manifests the second night and we dragged him into my office. We were doing an all night prayer this, the last night of the, of the prayer revival. We were supposed to pray from seven o'clock PM till six o'clock in the morning. So essentially 11 hours of prayer. And it took about six men to hold him down. We had to move my coffee table up to my office and we begin, he began to roar like a lion. All kind of demons began to speak out of him. And inwardly, I began to become discouraged. One, because I was tired of wrestling with this demon. Mind you, I was th three to four days into no food. I'm physically tired. We've been praying all night. And I remember saying to my team, I said, just hold him down. I'll be back. Keep working with him. Keep binding this demon and commanding it to go. Break these curses and go for it. And I went to the bathroom. And I went to use the bathroom. I really went to go talk to God. I was like, look, Lord, I'm tired. We've been doing this for three and a half hours, it seems like, four hours. And everyone's out here still praying, seeking the face of God. I have people singing, and thank God for Nova Hub Church, because they really just facilitated my moment while I had to go deal with something else. And I go to the bathroom, and I say, and the Lord says to me, son, I want you to remember this. I am inexhaustible. Demons are exhaustible. He said, I have no deficit. Demons can be worn out. And I remember that. And I knew by the spirit of God, all I had to do was outlast this demon. As long as I could pull from the strength of God to keep battling with this thing. Now, mind you, this demon is saying things to us. You know, the person, we knew it wasn't him, but he was saying very hurtful things to us. I mean, and it was, and the demon was imitating the person we were casting the devil out. So this was a spiritual son. There are little jokes that we have together, little traditions we have as a family that we do together. He, we have a favorite restaurant, a favorite store, and the demon was asking, hey, you wanna go to this store together? Hey, it's me, your son, you wanna go to this store together? And we knew by the sinister nature, it was not him, it was a demon. It would actually kind of make you infuriated because how dare you take control of someone that I love? And then at that moment, you kind of feel powerless because you're saying come out, you know you have authority, but the demon is stubborn and will not move. And I knew, I came back in there with a fresh grace on me. And it took me about two more hours. We were there for five hours, essentially, in the office, casting the demon out. And once we got it out, it was breakthrough. We gave him water. We gave him something to eat. I told everyone, at 12, we're going to take a break from prayer. Everyone can break their fast. And then we're going to pray till sunup. So at 12, everyone had already been eaten. We had finished up. And when I came up the office, everyone was kind of getting ready to pray again. And I was just so rejoiceful, rejoiceful that the demon had left. And so people are starting to come back from their restaurants and midnight snacks and things of nature. And we're singing African psalms, African songs, uh, Christian songs. Like, fire, 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 fire. And we're all like having a good time in the Holy Ghost. Good singing, no music, just going crazy in God. We all start praying again. Everyone's eating and everyone's asking me, do you want food? Can I get you some food? And I heard the Lord say, don't eat yet. Don't break your fast. So everyone's like begging me, please eat. You're tired. You just wrestled with a demon for five hours. And I said, I can't eat. I don't, I don't want to eat yet. I'll eat at sunup. And it makes sense because we know that Jesus says these kinds, certain demons only come out through prayer and fasting. And so it makes sense now because, you know, knowing the scripture, what the word says. And I remember I start praying and start singing. You would think another bomb went off in the room. I didn't even address demons. I just started praying and, and exhorting the crowd. Next thing you know, an invisible force just comes in the room 
and starts knocking people out of their chairs, knocking them off their feet. People go flying. I mean, the room was in pandemonium. And what we do at our church, what happens is we, when demons start manifesting, we try to keep the dignity of the person sometimes. So we'll lift sheets up to cover the person that's manifesting. It looked like tent city in our church because there were so many sheets up all over the room. And sometimes the people who were holding the sheets would start manifesting and we would have to put sheets around them. It was so crazy. I just began to cast out these demons. Men were screaming out, I mean, men, grown men were screeching in the back of the church. Several of my spiritual children just all began to manifest and begin to slither across the floor like snakes. This demon, it would begin to contort their faces. It they would come and tell me their name. And I began to wrestle with some of these things. And at one point I would start working with one demon, find someone who was not manifesting and not even people who were leaders, <clears throat> people who I just knew who knew God. Cast this demon out. Work with them. I got to go to somebody else. People were trying to run, trying to hit their head, all kind of crazy thing. Um, fight people. It was one of the wildest experiences of my life. And the demons, would, every time I would peek over the, the tent or the sheet, they would start calling my name. No, no, not him. Get him away from me. No. And I would come and wrestle with them and like hold them down. And the reason why I would wrestle with them because I didn't want their bodies to get hurt. Because demons on their way out, they'll try to hurt the person that they're manifesting through, banging their head on the floor. So I would like hold, try to hold their head up and begin to drive the demon out, command the demon to come out, all kind of various things. And it was very, very traumatizing. No, at that moment, like I told you before, in that moment when people you love are manifesting, you turn into Superman. You turn into, listen, I gotta do what I gotta do. And we gotta get these people free. Greater is he that is in me that's in the world, you know? And the entire night, I just kept on quoting that scripture to me, to myself. Greater is he that is in me than the world. Greater is he that is in me than he's in the world. Just kept on saying it to myself over again so I could get through the night. And it was so bad that we were casting demons out of people so they could get up, get their bearings together, and help me cast demons out. We were actually activating people in deliverance that night. And we did that till five o'clock in the morning. And then around five o'clock, we just worshiped, worshiped until like six o'clock. And for the next four or five days, I couldn't move or really leave the house for about a week after that. My body was stiff, it was sore. I was in physical pain from rolling across the floor. My voice was gone. And throughout the entire week, I felt like the, the devil was trying to torment me because when I would sleep, all I would see was the face of my spiritual children contorting. One of my sons, he smiled at me literally from ear to ear. And I don't want to glorify the devil with this, but I want to like say just how real this, I'm just, I can't express to you how real deliverance really is. I would see the images play in my head of the service every night, every day. And to the point I would just cry all day. And I remember I talked to one of my older brothers, my spiritual brother in the gospel. He's a powerful prophet from the UK. And I told him, I said, I'm done with deliverance. I said, I don't think I have the heart for this stuff. Because there's one thing when you're casting out demons out of people you don't know, but it's completely different when it's somebody you're, you, you're connected to, someone you love deeply. And that's why I kind of have a problem with today's deliverance movement, because people are embarrassing and shaming people. But we don't realize that's somebody's son. That's someone's daughter. Somebody loves that person. They're important to somebody. Why are we shaming and, and doing these things to people on camera when we should just get them free? It's our main goal should be, free, should be freedom. And that's when I said, I'm done with deliverance. This is about a little under a year ago. And my bro, um, very accurate prophet, he said, bro, when are you going to accept your identity that you are not just a healing minister? You are a deliverance minister. God has called you to the ministry of deliverance. And I said, I, I guess I accept it now. But I never asked for this. And I started complaining to God. I said, when I went on that 21 day fast, I didn't ask you for deliverance. I asked you for miracles. And then it brought me to this place of humility. Lord, I submit to whatever assignment you give me. And through that process of submission, I really begin to experience the healing power of God. Come on my body, come on, come on my mind because I was physically traumatized. And I would say deliverance is not for the faint of heart. If you're not ready to hear, experience crazy things, and if you don't know that you have the ability to love people beyond what's living on the inside of them, deliverance ministry ain't for you. And I learned what I needed was a greater capacity of love. 
to be able to minister to the demon eyes. And so that's pretty much like my story when it comes to deliverance and how I got involved in deliverance ministry. Jordan, did you ever, you yourself, experience deliverance in your life? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I've had two major deliverances in my life. One was by myself with the Lord. And another one was with my um, my grandmother and my aunt. I remember um, the, first t- no, the first time I was with them, I very much so manifested. But they did a, such a good job at concealing what was happening to me. Anyone was around, no one really would have known it was manifestation. I want to say I was around 14, 15 years old, but I can't really recall what happened. But I just remember coming to myself kind of crying. And I remember like my aunt wiping my tears from my face. And I knew that I had experienced like a level of deliverance. But the more radical deliverance for me, it was when I was around 17 years old. I was begging God for deliverance from lust. I was like, Lord, I don't want to be lustful. I don't want to look at a woman in that way. I don't want to be addicted to pornography anymore. Like I was begging God, set me free from this lust. And I remember the power of God came in my room so strong. This was before my encounter when I was 18. And I remember laying on my bed because I felt God so strong in my room, laying on my bed. And I remember going into almost like this vision and I couldn't see the face, but I saw these hands and the, the finger on this hand go down my chest. It was almost as if I was outside of my body. And I remember watching that hand reach into me. Now, this is going to sound really weird. Pulling an entity out, some kind of strange looking creature out, holding it and it like wiggling and being terrified and thinking, you know, inwardly, I'm like, what is that? You know, like, what the heck is that? It was that in me. And I remember watching my body close back up in this vision. And I still struggled with lustful thoughts after that. But I knew the demon that was sourced of it was out of my life. And that's how I knew. Now, the lustful thoughts and the, the, the struggle with lust, it ended about a year later. And a lot of times people, sometimes we think a struggle is a demon. A struggle is not necessarily a demon. But I knew the demon associated with it was gone out of my life. So, yeah, I, I've experienced deliverance myself, too. Jordan, for the people who are watching right now who are seeking deliverance, maybe they don't have a, a deliverance minister around them or, or their church is not operating in that. For that person who's watching right now saying, Man, I need deliverance. What can you say to that person? Well, I I could talk to you logically, and then I could talk to you spiritually. I could say, one, there's so much material out here for deliverance if you can't get to someone who can help you with deliverance. For an example, there's a great book called Prayers That Route Demons. There are plenty of deliverance books where you can read and you or experience deliverance just by reading these books. Another way to experience deliverance is by reading the Word, obviously. Um, what do I mean by that? The word divides soul from spirit. It's a sword. I, if you would study the times that Jesus would cast demons out of people, you can experience deliverance just by reading the story of Jesus as it relates to him casting out demons. Another way I would say is use the virtual platform to your advantage. Most deliverance ministries go virtual as well, and you can find someone that can meet with you via Zoom. And also, if you feel like your issue is that bad, the question is, how hungry are you? Can you drive or fly or find or go to somewhere that's reputable, that knows how to cast that devil out of you? Also, the biggest thing I tell people, I said, the scripture says this, resist the devil and he will flee. And so a lot of times people, they want someone to come work a miracle on them. But understand, sometimes if you resist the devil long enough, he'll come out of you. But it's also understanding your power as a Christian who have the Holy Spirit. If you have the Holy Spirit, you have been given the power to resist every demon that's working against you. And ultimately, you become unfruitful to him. So that's why I say that demon that you're wrestling with, you need deliverance from, he's exhaustible. But you have an inexhaustible spirit living in you, the Holy Ghost. So the whole, the, sometimes the, the answer is not who can lay hands on me. It's about how long can I last with Holy Spirit. Jordan, any last words to people who are watching your testimony right now? You're not any less anointed or saved or loved by God if you have a demon. If anything, you need a greater manifestation of his love towards you. So never think the presence of something else living inside of you makes you less of who you are. I have found that demons love to attach themselves to the most called, anointed, and appointed of people.
And that's it.